morning, everyone. Um, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Allison Neisler. This is my 18th year in FRC. I started out as a student and I've been coaching ever since. I'm the head coach and drive coach for Team 3538, the Robo Jackets out of Auburn Hills, Michigan. And coaching competitive youth robotics is my full time job. So I write curriculum for FRC and FTC teams, and I run day camps and after school programs as well. Um, Juan, do you want to do a quick win intro? Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Juan Chong. I'm a, uh, uh, I guess a, a, a lot of people um, in Mexico will know me as uh, one of the FTAs that uh, runs uh, some of the events down there. Um, I'm a product engineer working at uh, Analog Devices, and uh, I'm currently working with uh, FRC Team 900, the Zebra Corns. All right, so over the next 40 minutes, uh, my goal is to present a conceptual overview of the FRC electrical system, a bit of information on component selection, uh, reliability best practices and troubleshooting, and an overview of sensors and cameras. Um, so firstly, with the conceptual overview of the electrical system, I had an epiphany really just recently that after 17 years of teaching electrical as a series of components, that it makes more sense to teach electrical as a set of purposes that need a component to serve them. So going into that, um, the straightforward, simplest, possible way I can break down the purpose of the electrical system is to take power from the battery and signal from the driver station and use that to start and stop actuators on the robot. Um, so first of all, what's an actuator? So an actuator is a device that uses a source of energy to make something move. The main actuators on FRC robots are motors, servos, and air cylinders. Um, and then what's the driver station? The driver station is a laptop that's running the driver station program plus accessory devices to provide inputs. So some teams use game controllers, others use joysticks. Um, some teams get really fancy and use custom button boxes or button boards. Um, there's a lot of variety there, but it's the same core purpose. Um, aside from those three things, what's missing? So a if as you are reading this, you can look at what's missing, this list of what's missing, and name the components, that's a really good sign that you understand the core of the system. And if you can't, that's not a problem. It's a learning opportunity. And that's what we're going to go over. Um, the uh, components to split power out to more than one device, because odds are you're running more than one motor. Uh, something to power the system off, because it's dangerous to just have it running all of the time. A component to stabilize the battery voltage for devices that require regulated power a component to receive the signal from the driver station, a component to interpret the signal from the driver station and send it out to the devices on your robot, components to tell each motor when, how fast, and in which direction to spin, components to safeguard the electrical system from devices drawing too much power, a component to indicate when the system is powered on and or enabled, a component to control pneumatic devices, and then finally, all the wires to transmit the signal. Um, I will note that I don't recommend plugging batteries directly into the motor um, for a number of reasons, but the two biggest ones are probably safety and also a number of motors you can't just directly plug in without damaging them. Um, so first step in what we're going to add to this system is power distribution. 
which is the component that splits power out to more than one device. Uh, the current power distribution panel can support up to 16 devices. Um, and I would guess that almost every FRC robot has a minimum of six because you probably have four motors in your drivetrain at the very least, and you probably have a couple of other mechanisms as well. Um, for a lot of teams, especially in games like Infinite Recharge, it's really easy to max out the capacity of the power distribution uh, when you start taking into account the number of different mechanisms that it takes to handle the game objects uh, from acquisition to scoring. All right, next thing we're going to add is the main breaker, which is the component to power the system off and turn it back on again. Um, after that, we're going to add the voltage regulator, which stabilizes the battery voltage for devices that require regulated power. The battery can um, the power from the battery is not stable. It can be anything from 13 volts when it's fully charged down to eight to 10 at the end of a match. And a number of devices, specifically the radio, require um, a stable power source to continue functioning. So the radio gets attached to the voltage regulator and that receives the signal from the driver station. And then after that, next component we're going to add is um, the Robo Rio, which takes the signal from the driver station and sends it out to the devices on the robot. Each motor on the robot needs a motor controller, which is the device that tells the motor when, how fast, and in which direction to spin. And Every device also needs a breaker or a fuse, which is a component that um, safeguards the electrical system from devices drawing too much power by breaking the circuit if it is drawing too much power too quickly. The robot status light uh, indicates when the system is powered on and enabled. And the last major component is um, the pneumatic control module, which is a component that powers compressor, uh, pressure switch, and solenoids that control pneumatic cylinders. And finally, I mentioned this a few slides back, but um, the signal wires are the wires that take that signal from the Rio and send it out to the devices on the robot. Um, this is a super simplistic diagram. So uh, I haven't, um, to make it digestible and easy to understand, uh, there is a lot left out of this. So, um, the power over ethernet cable, which we'll talk about later, uh, more than two motors, because again, you probably have a minimum of six and likely more than that. Um, any sensors and cameras that provide inputs to the Robo Rio. Um, any sort of PWM signal devices, which we'll talk about later. Uh, all of the rest of the pneumatics components and servos. Uh, if you're looking for more detailed diagrams, there's a whole lot of them available. Um, this is one of my favorites uh, by Team 3128. And this one by 3161 is also um, a really solid overview of the core components as well as how they're connected and wired up to each other. Uh, questions so far or anything to add? All right. Um, so I don't have a lot of slides on this. So this is something that like, feel free to jump in and add or everyone listening, ask questions. Um, coming down to component selection, the 
core components of the electrical system are dictated. So the rules require that a specific component or a very small selection must be used. Um, and there's really not a whole lot of options. So that includes the battery, the robo Rio, the radio, power distribution, voltage regulation, pneumatics control, and the robot status light. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about those in selection because the options are limited. Um, the key components, the key controls components of which there is a lot of options uh, comes down to the motors and the motor, motor controllers. Um, so at this point, teams will find themselves facing two key decisions um, using brushed versus brushless motors and using CAN versus PWM signal. Uh, the Actually, Allison, if you want to, I can jump in here. Yeah, go um, for it. Yeah, so uh, brushed and brushless motors have their benefits and their drawbacks. Um, so brushed motors, as the kind of the name implies, there are brushes that actually contact the um, the core of the motor and actually transfers that energy um, into the windings on those magnets. Oh, you can you can keep sharing into that same diagram. You're good. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll wait for it to come. I'll back put it back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and those uh, those benefits and those drawbacks are that DC brushed motors. You know, they're very reliable. They've been used in FRC for many many years. Um, you know, you know them as the the sim motors. The um, the mini sims, the bag motors, any of the Andy Mark motors. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're very common, they're very reliable, they're very easy to power and to control. Um, you have two wires and if you wanna make it spin one way, you apply, you know, uh, power, you know, red to red, black to black. If you want to reverse it, you reverse the, the uh, connection and that's pretty much how they work. Uh, brushless motors, um, so either the Falcon 500 or the uh, Neo motor, um, operate a little bit differently. There is actually nothing connecting those, uh, the, or transferring power, um, I guess, from one uh, directly into the core of the motor. Um, so they work completely on just energizing the windings around and using the core of the magnet, which is what you see here, that north and that south on that right on the right hand side uh, diagram. Um, so that allows them to be more efficient and it gives them what's known as a lot of low end low end torque. So a lot of um, um, they're very powerful, even if the motor is not spinning. Uh, DC motors are, they're more powerful, they're more, more efficient um, as they're spinning faster. So they're, they're, there are trade-offs in when you want to use one versus another. Um, you know, the other difficulty is controls, right? In a, in, with a brushless motor, you can't just take the wires, plug them in, and make it go. Um, the motors themselves have to have a control wire. They have to have, um, you know, a connection uh, to the motor controller, so the motor controller knows where they are. Um, and Allison's going to talk about this a little bit later. But you know, reliability comes into question, right? Do you want something that's really, really reliable in your brush motors, or do you want something that you know has a couple more failure points but is more efficient and more powerful, right? And those are the brush brushless motors. Um, so those are those are some of the key differences. Um, okay. Any questions on that? All right. Um, just a second, I need to restart this. <laughs> yeah, and, um, please let us know if you have any questions. We're we're happy to answer them. Okay. 
Um, so on the brushless motors, um, which are two I just decided to uh, feature quickly, um, because they are newer to the market and less teams are familiar with them. Um, as far as uh, replacements for the sim motor, there are two uh, key options, uh, the Falcon 500 by VEX and the NEO by REV. Um, you'll find people that have a lot of strong opinions on which one is the best. Uh, having used both, I can say that both of them are awesome. And um, the most critical difference between them is that the Falcon 500 has an integrated speed controller and the Neo has a separate speed controller. Um, that's very much a personal preference thing and up to your team. Uh, there's benefits to both. So i um, not gonna go too deep into that, but I just wanted to mention. Actually, Allison, um, I'm gonna jump in really quick there. We actually have a couple questions in the chat. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Can you get those? Yeah, um, and let's, well, yeah, if you want to keep going, then I'll, I'll type out answers. You're good. Uh, no, eh, voy, voy, a hacer un, voy a hacer un pequeño eh, paréntesis. No mm -hmm. sé si a ustedes como ponentes les gustaría que todas las preguntas se juntaran para el final, o si lo prefieren, las puedo hacer en este momento, eh, como ustedes me digan. Ba, um, Ricardo, yo sí hablo español, pero este, Allison no habla español. Este, okay. so, so let me, if you want to translate for her. Ok, me parece que mi intérprete eh, debe de estar ahí. Ah, ok. Sí. No, no hay problema, entonces yo, yo traduzco. Um, Alison, uh, Ricardo is asking whether you'd like to take the questions now or at the end. Let's take questions as they happen. And okay. if you take questions and answer them in Spanish, that's fine with me. Ok. Sure. <laughs> ok. <laughs> That'll work. Sin, uh, sin problema. Eh, si quieren, para facilitarles a ustedes, yo les voy a ir pasando las las preguntas para que uh -huh. ustedes las puedan responder. And in the meantime, while my interpreter gets here, I'm going to be speaking in English for Allison, okay? So, okay, so the first question, Anonymous, is... Okay, me parece que ya me están traduciendo. Entonces, ¿qué porcentaje de batería es la primera pregunta? ¿Qué porcentaje de batería es el recomendado para entrar a Match? Que ya... Viene de los temas anteriores. Ok. Um, eh, le, le voy a traducir a Alison para que sepa qué es la pregunta. Este, y luego, si quieren, yo la contesto en español, no hay problema. Um, so the first question, Alison, is what percentage of uh, battery is recommended um, when you enter a match, as going into a match? Um, I mean, I, th um, I think you and I. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, so... I'm going to answer truthfully for us. Keep in mind that we hold like crazy high standards for our batteries. And I got burned in 2018 by losing two matches to a dead battery. Um, and I vowed that that was never going to happen again. So we now purchase 16 brand new batteries every year. Um, and we don't put a battery on the field unless it's showing 130% charge. Um, we also only use each battery once per day, aside from like crazy extreme situations. Um, we, in state championship finals in 2019, we played 16 matches in a day. Um, and we were sharing batteries with our partners at that point. Um, but like those really unusual situations aside, we don't put a battery on the field under 130. Sometimes like maybe 127, but. Actually, I mean, it it may sound very extreme, but I, you know, I, okay, I, you know, on, on my old team, on 2655, we didn't quite take it to that extreme. We did use batteries once or twice a day, that kind of thing. <laughs> but but um, it's very important to remember that the state of the battery, it, it, it will, it determines a lot of the outcome of the match. Truly, it does. Um, if you have a weak battery, if you have a battery that sometimes works or doesn't last quite as long or things like that, um, like it, it can affect you in your match. Um, we, I, I can share this. I'll, I'll actually add it to the answer. 
Um, we did uh, some ba intensive battery testing. I actually, you know, because I work for analog devices, I borrowed a, a, a an, ele an electronic load, a real one that can pull 20 amps continuous per channel and tested batteries. And I found that there were a lot of batteries, even if you measure them directly off of the charger, if you take the battery beak that Allison is gonna talk about in a little bit and you plug it into the battery, it may look like it's okay until you start pulling power and then it's not gonna be very happy. Um, we, you know, we recommend, we've usually cycled our batteries out every two or three years. Um, if, uh, I, I understand that it's more difficult to obviously get the batteries in Mexico and everything else and importing and it's, it's a mess, but um, if you can and you find a source for it, I highly recommend that you refresh your batteries every two or three years. Um, the worst thing you can do to your batteries is in the off months and, you know, whenever we're not working outside of build season, leaving the batteries, you know, just sitting there, not, not connected to anything can actually harm them. Um, so keeping them on a charger is actually not a bad thing, assuming that the charger is a smart charger. Yep. Um, okay. My I guess I have one Sorry, more quick comment related to the batteries um, and also going back to brushed versus brushless motors. Um, I had been told, you know, so we didn't switch to brushless motors until uh, the off season between 2019 and 2020. And obviously I was aware that uh, the electrical efficiency was one of the huge advantages of brushless motors, um, but I definitely underestimated it. So in 2019, we were running six mini sims. So we were running brushed motors on our drivetrain. And by the end of the season, battery management was a huge ordeal for us. Um, like, you know, it was something that we were paying attention to every match. We had somebody dedicated specifically to that. Um, in the off season, post season, when we were doing uh, competitions, our, we were regularly to the point where we were browning out towards the end of matches. And then we took that exact same robot and those exact same batteries. And in testing before 2020, we put brushless motors in that drivetrain and we did not have a single problem with those batteries and that robot browning out after that point. Um, so okay. the, that was significant. Okay, well, thank you very much. The next question also anonymous. What could cause the radio signal to fail? Uh, should we go back to that? Well, as, as you wish, maybe I can tell you the question related to this specific topic we're in about. There are some questions though from the previous topic. So as you tell me, we're gonna do it. Okay. okay. Uh, Actually, Allison, you've got a slide like two or three slides after this, I think, that talks about that. Um, if we have questions, let's go back. I'll go back to the controllers, but I'll come to reliability since that seems to be of interest. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking generally about reliability, uh, my team focuses hugely on this. Um, We've existed for seven years, and our goal is to never experience the same failure twice. Matches are a valuable resource, and you pay a lot of money for them. I think in a regional setting, you're paying somewhere between $200 and $400 per match, depending on how, many, how far you go into playoffs. So to get the most value from your experience, you want to be moving every match. Um, and the other way that we think about reliability is we think about reliability as the floor, as in like the, you know, the worst you will ever do in a match. And a lot of teams or in a lot of presentations focus on the ceiling, like what's, how are you going to maximize your points and what's the best you'll be able to score. But for us, we focus on the floor because you are unlikely to play your best match during your most important match. Your best match will be like some random qualification match on Friday morning when everything comes together and you have, you know, you're vibing really awesome with your alliance partners and communication is great and 
your plan worked out perfectly and your drivers are at the top of your game and every mechanism on your robot works perfectly and everything falls into place and that'll be your best. But that's not your most important match. Your most important match is going to be that one qualifying match you really have to win to get the seed that you need. Or finals two, which becomes the difference between a banner and not a banner. So reliability in terms of maintaining the floor is super important. And before you pay attention to your ceiling, you want to pay attention to your floor and what's the worst you will ever do. Um, Reliability in terms of the control system and the electrical is even more important because if that fails, you are unlikely to be able to recover in the time period of the match, and you are unlikely to be able to do anything else at all with a failing control system. Like if your manipulator fails, at least you can still drive. You can probably play defense and maybe you can get end game points. But if your control system goes, you're dead in the water. Um, the last point I have on reliability with electrical, which isn't in here, but or it was, isn't a bullet point, but is still important to understand, is that electrical reliability requires um, more preparation than mechanical. Because when something is mechanically wrong, you can look at it and you can be like, that gear doesn't have any teeth, or that part is bent and that's why it's not working. But electrical, you can't necessarily look at it and be able to see the problem. Um, so maintaining that reliability is super important. Um, Keys to reliability, and I've just listed a few that are like something that my team is focused on a lot. There's a whole lot of things that could be added here, so feel free to ask questions. Um, first thing is install a good charged battery every match, um, and I highly recommend investing in a battery beak. And if you can't invest in a battery beak, then find a friend at your competitions and ask if they can beak your battery before each match. Um, as a point of note, um, even though you're starting every match with a good charged battery, it's really important to test your end of match mechanisms with an end of match battery. Um, this is super important for something like climbers, where if you only test them in your shop or on the practice field by sticking a brand new battery in there, then you're working with 12 or 13 volts and not the 10 that you're going to have at the end. Um, Allison, I'm going to jump in here too. Um, like what Allison just said, be very careful because it's not just, you know, we think when we think a low battery, we think, ah, motors, you know, yep, they're not going to spin as fast or whatever, not have enough torque. But remember, you have other actuators like pneumatics, pneumatics, uh, um, uh, solenoids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um, require either 12 or 24 volts and those voltages aren't adjusted. So if you if your battery is idling at 9, 10, 11 volts, something like that, 9 volts maybe, 8 volts maybe, your solenoids may not actuate. So really think about that. Uh, there's a question in the uh, in the Q&A that asks, you know, what percentage of battery uh, is used up in a match? Um, I think the, the right answer is once the uh, you know once the battery is used on a robot for a match or for practice or for whatever, assume that it is it is you know used and just put it back on the charger. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, I think we pull batteries out of the robot regularly at like sixty percent from the battery beak. Um, we do beak every battery when we take it out of the robot as well. Um, so that we have a good understanding of how much power we're pulling during, firstly, on the robot side, how much power we're pulling during a match. And then secondly, on the battery side, if there's a particular battery that's getting drained, um, like more so than all of the others, we just take that one out of the rotation before it causes a failure. Um, the other thing that I'm going to point out while I have this up as far as batteries go is this number on the battery beak is something that I didn't learn about until like three years ago, which was 15 years into doing FRC. Um, 
but the internal resistance of the battery is a super critical number. So our uh, competition batteries, we try to keep them in the like 0.015 to 0.017 range. Um, it can get really bad. Like I have practice batteries that are in the like 0.04 range the status on those just straight up says bad like they're very bad i'm at this point kind of curious as to how long they can last before like they just don't power the robot at all um, which is why i still have them in a rotation it's an experiment but um in addition to the charge status that's the other key thing i look at the internal resistance anything else on batteries or any of the other questions yeah also about reliability. We're getting a few questions about what you just said of maintaining the batteries connected in the off season period. I don't know if you could come back to that so they can, so you could explain again. Okay. Um, so we don't actually have storage uh, routines for our batteries because we operate year round. Um, COVID notwithstanding the two prior years, we competed in 12 or 13 events, um, counting both our in-season and off-season events. So I actually can't answer that question because I have not yet had to store batteries because I am always using them until they die. Um, but Juan, do you have? Yeah, um, so the, the, the best thing to do, the best practice is to never store batteries fully charged. Um, I mean, there's a chemical process and you can go on to battery, I think it's like batteryuniversity.com or something to really learn about these types of batteries. But um, what you want to do is you want to discharge, if you're going to store them without having them plugged in or anything on, a tr on what's called a trickle charge, which is basically just maintaining the voltage at like 12.6 volts or something, um, you need to discharge the batteries before you put them into storage. Um, not completely. You need to discharge them to about 80%, which, you know, you put the battery beak on there and you measure it, you know, about what you need. You just don't want to store them charged, completely charged. Um, over time, what will happen is the total capacity that you can use in the battery will start to shorten. Um, so, and on, I linked it in one of the answers. There's actually a, uh, a plot of a good battery and a bad battery on that GitHub site. Um, essentially, your, your good time will start to get shorter, and that good time is your match time. So basically, if you're going to store the batteries, um, discharge them a little bit, um, or keep them on a trickle charger so that they all can maintain um, uh, I guess a constant voltage. They don't start to discharge. They don't start to build up um, crystals on the plate. Like I said, there's a lot of physics behind in chemistry. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yep. So also about, I, I think this is more about the, the ways to use the energy in the best form. They're asking us what type of motor uses the less energy during a match? Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the, an the trick answer to that question is a motor that's not spinning. <laughs> um, but it, it depends. It's, I think uh, the question might be better answered as um, use the, or might be answered as uh, use the right motor for the job, right? Um, like Allison, I think you mentioned it a little bit earlier that brushless motors seem to be more efficient but you know you're not going to want to use like a neo 550 on you know a drivetrain right yeah um it's it and it's that, hard to say that also gets into a lot of the mechanical side with gearing um so yeah that has to be a use the right motor for the job there's not a yeah one or the other i'm i mean from you know from experience i can say you know the, the Neos have treated us really well. And, you know, the Spark Maxes had a couple issues the first year they were out, but they're, they, they're great now. Um, you know, I just, we've had a good experience with them, but, you know, then again, people have had good experiences with the, the Falcons and, you know, brushed motors still have their uses. Like um, if you're building an elevator, um, 
like I mentioned, benefits and drawbacks, right? Um, if you're building an elevator and you ha it has to maintain a certain position and you don't do your gearing right and you're relying on the motor, a brushed motor is actually going to give you uh, more reliability because it can sit there and hold, you know, basically you can stall the motor for a lot longer than a brushless motor. So it depends on your mechanical system. Okay, also so some of the questions are kind of right to the point. So they are telling us, what about peak voltage? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's Allison, maybe see what you think of this one. You know, what happens when there are voltage spikes, I guess? Um, yep. right indeed. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so this goes, um, I guess I won't go into detail on this, but to uh, for whoever asked the question, something to look up is PDP logging. Um, and that will give you a lot of information about kind of your electromechanical system. So that's something that you can research and implement and look at. And if there's a particular system or a particular motor or a particular time during a match or action that causes a spike, then that's a red flag to go look at it and understand it. Um, it's kind of too broad to have like a general like rule of thumb on, but it's a good thing to be aware of and the PDP logging and um, looking at the current draw from each port is the way you find out that information and at least identify when it's happening. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. So we got a bunch of other questions, but about the radio, also the, ro the, ro the, ro the robo Rio and the controllers, but about batteries, we're all set. I don't know if you'd like to continue okay. or we can go uh, back a bit. Yeah. Let's get through a couple more slides and then we can go to the radio questions. Um, all right, so uh, last thing on the batteries um, and the reliability is do not lose your battery um, because losing your battery is a real sad way to lose a match. Um, so step one is build a super secure battery compartment. And when you're building your battery compartment, assume that your robot is being shaken violently while upside down and ask yourself if your battery is going to stay put. Um, a 13 pound object carries a ton of momentum. So if your robot is moving at 12 or 14 or 16 feet per second and comes to an abrupt stop when it hits another robot or a stationary object on the field, your battery is going to want to keep moving. Um, so keeping that battery um, secure with both like physical mounting components and then Velcro straps will prevent it from popping out of the robot. And secondly, the um, power poles, the Anderson connectors on the battery, we zip tie those together before every match. So the first goal is that the battery never leaves the robot. And then even if the battery does leave the robot, that connection stays secure. Um, I, I can attest, I've seen several matches that, you know, the robot was, you know, at the end of the match and everything else and the battery fell out of the robot. But the team, like, they were literally dragging the battery around as, you know, while driving their robot. But the only reason that it was working was because of that zip tie. Um, this does mean that you have to cut a zip tie every match and you have to put a zip tie on the robot every match. But like Allison said, if every match is, you know, four, three, four hundred dollars, a zip tie is worth it, right? Like, seriously, this, do this. Um, a zip yeah. tie and a pair of two dollar zip tie cutters for every member of your pit crew to keep in their pockets. Exactly. Um, and well, maybe we'll add this to the slides later, but also make sure that all of your connections are tight and they're secure. I mean, all of the connections, the, the bolts that you have to connect the big cables to, make sure that all of that is secure. Because if any of those connections are loose, I the robot will start doing really weird things, browning out, disconnecting, just odd things. Um, and as, as uh, having been on a team where we were half a match away from Einstein because of this. I highly recommend that you do it. All of these anyway. keys to reliability came from painful traumatic experiences. Yep, yep. Um, all right, 
so next, this is the other super critical thing, maintain your radio power. And this is really important because if your radio loses power or browns out, it's going to be at least 45 seconds before it reboots and you get your connection back again, um, by which point you've lost a significant amount of the match. Um, so the best ways to do this or the best way to do this is to use redundant power. So use both the barrel jack connector in the radio and the power over ethernet cable. Um, it's sold by Rev and I think it comes in the kit. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And um, this Make has been a significant improvement to all of my radio power experiences. Absolutely. I mean, and, and make sure that you're plugged into the PoE port. Like I, you know, we wanted to make this very explicit because I can't tell you how many times, you know, teams have come up to me and said, but I'm using PoE and it's in the wrong port. If it's in the wrong port, you're only being powered off of the barrel jack. So it's like if the PoE connector was never there, just, yeah. Um, we also tape both of those in. Um, one, so for every, for every connection between the radio and the battery, uh, tug test everything. So tug test the um, power cables from the radio going into the VRM, tug test the power cable from the VRM to the PDP, tug test uh, PDP to the main breaker, um, and tug test your uh, power pole connections between your battery and your PDP. Mm -hmm. Yep. Try to I wiggle the connections, oh. I guess. Yeah. You're good. I don't know if you'd like to go back to a few questions about the radio. Yeah, mm -hmm. let's do those now. Yep. Got time. Yeah, we get time. So first of all, uh, maybe this is a bit of an open question. What could cause a radio signal to fail? Um, I mean, I guess as an FTA, I can tell you that it's almost always radio power. Like, yeah. like ninety-five percent of it is radio power. The uh, the last five percent is going to be um, the radio itself might be, you know, bad or or something like that. Um, these radios, if they're subjected to to shock, like you know like you, somebody dropped it a couple of times or it's been sitting, you know, in a box or, you know, something like that, like the, they, they don't handle shock very well. So if that has happened to the radio, really try it and test it before you put it on the field. If you have any doubts, if you have any questions about it, ask your FDA beforehand. Like if you get to a competition and you, you don't think that your radio works well, ask the FDA, ask the, the LRI or whomever, or a spare um, and make, you know, test that. Um, that's honestly most of it. Yeah, just seconding that as long as you keep it stable powered and like keep the power stable. We've done all sorts of, like we've put our radios in all sorts of terrible places uh, on like prototyping and practice and secondary robots and keep the power to it. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, any other radio related questions? That's okay. So right now there are no more questions, but I'd like to <laughs> make a remark on when just what just Juan said. So I I've seen this in both uh, U.S. and Mexico regional events. There is some kind of a fear of some teams to the FTA. I'm not sure why, but I don't know if you could tell us, Juan. In the end, you are there to help the teams, to help them be ready, to help them be ready for the matches. So what would you suggest for those teams that are that are afraid or are frightened of the FTA to get to go for help, for help with you? Um, I mean, definitely try to try to talk to like, talk to the FTA. Um, we, you know, as we as FTAs, we're, we're there to help the teams We're there, we're there to run the event, but we're also there to help the teams. And, you know, I'm, I'm the way I handle things and I do things. Um, I, I don't want to 
watch teams just, you know, sit on the field or not show up to matches or anything like that. Um, I, you know, a good day for me is getting every team to play and watching every team play. Um, you know, don't, don't be afraid to ask us a question or anything. Um, you know, that's, that's also what the rest of the support staff is there for. Um, um, okay. So my team's tactic for that, which like we started explaining to our students maybe three years ago, is when you start having a problem, that's a good time to consider your options for help. So even if you have three or four ideas on like what you can do to solve it, if you can send one member of your pit crew over to an FTA and say, hey, we're having this problem, we have these ideas, we're going to work on it. But if you have a chance, could you stop by? That means that, you know, if there is someone free, it doesn't hurt to have help. And we have had so many helpful tips come in that we were completely unaware of um, just because of that willingness to go like heads up that we maybe might need help, even though we're still trying to solve it on our own. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So, well, thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. Um, we're really close to the end. Uh, so I'm just going to like super breeze through these last couple slides. Um, first of all, troubleshooting. Things are definitely going to go wrong. Uh, have as many things go wrong in practice as possible. Um, so uh, with regards to electrical, uh, space out components and leave room for your wiring. Um, route and bundle the wires neatly and logically. I can't tell you the number of times students were like, oh, these two completely unrelated wires run parallel to each other. Let me zip tie them together. That makes troubleshooting kind of a nightmare when it happens because it makes it very difficult to isolate problems. Um, we use color-coded zip ties to label everything. So from a motor to a motor controller to the PDP, there'll be like little blue zip ties, which make tracing uh, like blue and green and yellow, make tracing all of the motors much easier. Uh, we label all of our components and we also match those labels to the names and software um, so that when we need to go check on which like, um, motors and motor controllers are together, that makes that easy. And we keep a schematic uh, labeled laminated and with us that shows all of that information. Um, indicator lights are your best friend. There are indicator lights on almost every device and there are handy dandy guides for what those indicator lights mean um, in practice. Um, so. This is the one that I was uh, rushing to get through for troubleshooting. Um, the most valuable thing we have done for electrical is we have intentionally and consciously set up troubleshooting practice for electrical. So we will have one team member take the electrical system and intentionally mess something up on it. So take out a breaker or make a cable loose, but not quite all the way out, or switch a motor and a motor controller. And then another student's job is to race to identify if there's a problem, what the problem is, and how to fix it. And setting our students up to practice their troubleshooting skills helps them develop a natural sense of what order to look for problems and also what symptoms are associated with which different problems. So on that last open question on any advice for rookie teams, that's my advice. Practice having a problem um, so that you know what to do when it happens for real. Yep. So. Um, yeah, and, and like Allison said, just look for look for potential issues, right? Make sure that your that everything is secured correctly. Make sure that you know that do your tug tests. Make sure the connections are good. Make sure that everything works right um, be before you get to the competition. So awesome. Well, it's been an amazing four minutes. Thank you both to you, uh, Allison and Juan. I'm sure most of the teams here will have more and more questions. So. I don't know if you could give us any way to reach out to you. So if there is any other yeah, questions. Yeah, definitely. Here. Um, I will put it up on the screen and I will send it in chat. Actually, that's 